Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can sing hallelujah. Lord, we can pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us and that you would inspire us, that you would convict us, that you would change us, that you would transform us. Lord, we pray that you would move by your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So this is the second last uh, part of the series that we're doing on um, encounters with Jesus. Next Sunday, we'll, we'll finish the series uh, looking at uh, the woman that had an alabaster box and broke it um, at the feet of Jesus. But uh, today, we're going to look at a, a very interesting story. Uh, Colin read that passage from Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, and it's about a man who was possessed by evil spirits. It's probably one of the most uh, supernatural stories, we can say, mystical stories, we can say in the Gospels. Um, You know, as as we live in a different time period than Jesus, and we live in a different uh, Western society and culture as well than in other parts of the world, uh, sometimes these things of the spirit realm are often something that maybe we can't relate to or things that we can't maybe understand or imagine or wonder how do these things actually actually happen. Uh, but in actual fact, in many places around the world, mysticism and, and spiritual activity is actually quite normal. Um, I think just in the Western society and world that we live in, sometimes we find it a little bit difficult to talk about some of these things. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole uh, doctrinal analysis uh, or about evil spirits and who they are and what they do and how they work. What I really would like to just concentrate on this morning from this story is the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus to set free, the power of Jesus to liberate, the power of Jesus to heal, the power of Jesus to restore, the power of Jesus to save, the power of Jesus to do something supernatural in our lives that can change us radically, profoundly, and completely. So I want to first look at it. You can see the notes in your bulletin. It's just three sort of sections that I want to work through this morning as we look at this passage from Mark chapter 5. And the first one is just a a revelation uh, and an understanding of who Jesus is specifically about his power. Now, uh, throughout this story, uh, this story is actually surrounded before and after by glimpses of Jesus's power. Uh, We need to understand and we also need to believe that Jesus is powerful. And sometimes it might be difficult for us to comprehend uh, that power. But before this encounter in Mark chapter 5, we read about how the disciples and Jesus were traveling on a boat crossing a lake, right? This is in Mark chapter 4. We won't take time to read all of the stories, but uh, in Mark chapter 4, we find Jesus and his disciples on a boat. They're crossing the lake, and there's this huge storm that's taking place, and Jesus, while the storm is taking place, can anyone tell me, if you know the story, what is Jesus doing? He's sleeping, so you all know the story, okay? Some of you, at least, know the story. Jesus is sleeping here. The disciples, now remember, some of these disciples were fishermen, so they would have been used to rough waters, rough you know, waves and things like that. But these fishermen, these disciples, they were scared and they were worried, and they woke Jesus up and said, Jesus, don't you care that we are going to die? Because look at this big storm. Jesus got up, he rebuked the winds and the waves, and the Bible says that everything became quiet. Mark 4 verse 41 says, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. Here, Jesus is displaying his power over nature. Jesus is displaying this awesome power that he has over nature. And we have to understand believe, and believe that Jesus is powerful. Jesus has all power, right? In this earthly realm and in the heavenly realm as well. And here we see him having power over nature. Then we come to the story in Mark 5 verses 1 to 20 about Jesus casting demons out of this man. But right after this story in Mark chapter 5, we read about another story of a woman who suffered for for 12 years with constant bleeding. She was infirm. She was sick. And the Bible says that she went to the doctors and she spent everything she had in order to try to get better. And sadly, after spending it all, she was actually worse off than when she started. But she knew 
somehow, I don't know how, the Bible doesn't say clearly how this woman knew, but she knew that somehow if she could come and just touch the robe, the hem of Jesus' robe, of his garment, that she would be healed. In Mark 5, 28 and 29, it says, For she thought to herself, If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Can you believe today with me that Jesus has power to heal? Can you believe with me today that Jesus has power over the winds and the waves, over nature, and he has power over our body as well to bring health and healing to us? This is Jesus displaying his power over sickness and illness. Now, right after the story as well, we come to another story of a man named uh, Jairus. He was a, a leader of the synagogue. And his daughter was sick and dying. And he came to Jesus and said, can you come and, and pray for my daughter and heal my daughter? But as this is happening, he gets the news, Jairus, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble Jesus anymore. Like, we are past gone now. There's no more hope. But what does Jesus say in verse 36? He says, but Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Can I ask you something this morning? Can you have faith with me to believe that Jesus is powerful? Can you have faith with me today that Jesus can heal? Can you have faith with me today to believe that Jesus can transform lives? Can you have faith with me today that if we have an encounter with the living God today, that he will do something radical, that he will do something amazing, that he will do something awesome, that he will do something that will change our lives, our family, and our church? Can we believe the Lord today? Because here it says, it says here, the, the rest of the story in verse 42, the girl who was 12 years old after Jesus prayed for her immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. This was Jesus again displaying his power over death. Jesus displays his power over the wind and the waves, over nature. Jesus displays his power over sickness by healing that woman. Jesus displays his power over death and says, hold on, I'm all powerful. Now, sometimes we read these stories and we think, oh, that happened 2,000 years ago, but does that happen today? But let me ask you today, can you believe with me? Jesus said, just have faith. What is our situation today? Do we believe in the power of Jesus? Do we believe in the healing power of Jesus? Do we believe that Jesus is able to deliver us, to save us, to set us free, to heal us? Jesus told his disciples, Matthew 28, just before he left, in this great commission that he was about to give to the disciples, he says this. He came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. There is nothing too hard for him. And let me tell you that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and for... Can you believe with me that the same God that healed Jairus' daughter or raised her from the dead is the same God today? Can you believe with me that the same God who calmed the waves and the seas can bring peace and calm to our lives? Can you believe with me today that the, the, the woman that was healed of her infirmity by Jesus, that that Jesus is the same today? And he'll be the same tomorrow? And he'll be the same the day after? It wasn't just about believing the authority of Jesus. But another thing we see in this story is a revelation of who Jesus is in his divinity. It was not, it, it, the, this man came running to Jesus, and he acknowledged who Jesus is. In verse 6 and 7, he runs to him, he meets him, he bows down to him, and he cries out, he screams, why are you interfering with me, Jesus? Who? Son of the Most High God. In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Even the devils and demons knew who Jesus was. In our encounter with Jesus, there must be an acknowledgement. There must be a confession of Jesus' divinity, that he is the Son of God. Part of believing that Jesus has power is believing that he also is the Son of God, is believing also that he is divine. If we want an encounter with him today, let's be ready for two things, to see how his power works within us by faith, and to acknowledge that he is 
Lord. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, now this, talk, so this can talk about an initial salvation of when we come and give our lives to the Lord, but I don't know about you, but I need Jesus to save me every day. There are trials and tribulations, and I cry out, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me. For it is with your heart you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. We need to confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Some years ago when I was, uh, when I was training under an, an older pastor, he's now gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, he was from the United States, but uh, this happened actually when, when he was here in Toronto, pastoring a church here in Toronto many years ago, and he told us the story of how one day after a service, a woman came up to him. He was a tall, built man, more than six feet tall. This woman came up to him after the service and wanted to talk to him, so he said, okay. They sat down together, and she was talking, and she had some real spiritual problems going on. And all of a sudden, she was possessed, and she grabbed him by the neck and started to lift him up. This big, huge man. You know what he said? In the name of Jesus. That woman just fell down right there. Why? There's power in the name of Jesus. Now, let's see the reaction of the people. After Jesus had healed and restored the man, the people tending to the pigs, they ran off. And they reported everything that happened. They, they were probably so concerned. Why? They lost 2,000 pigs. That's not a small thing, right? Probably everyone in the area knew that man, and probably everyone in that area was afraid of that man. Maybe even parents tre threatened their children. I don't know, if parents, if you do this. If you're bad, I'm going to send you over there. Maybe they threatened their children and said, if you're bad, I'm sending you over to Legion, that guy. Right? <laughs> oh, all the, the, the youth in this section can relate to that, it seems. Right? Many, many, there could have been some people that were even related to that man, right? Maybe, they, maybe the people in that area remembered him as a child, remember the good old days. Maybe they remembered when he was growing up with them, right? But don't you think that if this man was healed and restored, the natural, normal response would be rejoicing and happiness? That, I think, is the normal response. This guy was, who was bound, this guy who was cutting himself, this guy who was screaming, the guy who was bound with chains, nobody wanted anything to do with him. Now he's healed and whole, and he's in his right mind, and he's there with Jesus. Would you not be happy for somebody like that? But instead, their reaction was the total opposite. We don't see any rejoicing. We don't see any welcome home party for the man. We don't see, uh, you know, that, that these people even, even cared for him. Their response, they begged Jesus to leave. Mark 5, verse 17, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Why did they do this? Now, it doesn't say exactly, but I think I'd like to just infer maybe two, two things here of why they might have wanted Jesus to leave. And the first thing is that I think they may have valued their possessions over people. They may have had a priority system that actually valued possessions over a person's soul. See, Jesus cost them a lot in terms of worldly wealth. 2,000 pigs, it's a lot. Even today, there's probably some people that will look at the story and say, well, what about the pigs? It wasn't fair to them. Maybe they thought, what else might we lose? If Jesus continues to hang around in this place, it's not only just 2,000 pigs that we're going to lose, maybe we can lose some other things. See, they were fine with the man breaking chains, cutting himself, screaming. But when it affected their bottom line, oh no, Jesus, don't hang around here. When it affected their worldly wealth, no, Jesus, don't stay here. You better leave this place. In Luke 15, it says that there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents, when even one person comes to know Jesus, when even one person has an encounter with God, when even one person is healed and restored, there's rejoicing in heaven. Can you see how God values people? Can you see how God puts a priority on people even way more than worldly wealth? Can you put a price tag on this? No, you can't. 
How about us? Do we value our possessions more than people? Do we value our time and our money and our comforts more than investing into people? So many, to- so many times, instead of rejoicing in others, instead of investing in others, instead of helping others, we look at how it affects us. And that's what these people did. We look at how it affects us, and we don't want to do it. Oh, it's going to take too much of my time. Oh, it's not worth it to invest that money into that program or that initiative or that person. Oh, that's, that's too difficult, so I won't do it, even though it will be a blessing for that person. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us so, that, so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is what real love is. We put a value on people, even if it means giving up our, our own life. Can you see the preciousness of souls, the preciousness of people? If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. See, these people, instead of rejoicing in the fact that this man who was doomed for destruction now has life, and his life was turned around completely. They were more concerned with themselves And they didn't want Jesus to make any more changes in their lives. They revealed that they valued pigs more than a man's salvation. And in turn, their own salvation because they sent Jesus away. So let's not make that mistake. The second thing I think that we can maybe uh, infer or, or try to see why do these people actually send Jesus away is it could be a possibility is that they feared Jesus' presence. Right? This was a Gentile area, and, and Jesus came ashore, and he, was, he had a profound impact. And maybe they feared his power and his authority. Not only that, that man was radically transformed in a moment. And maybe they feared what the presence of Jesus might do to them. Are we like that? Last week, we talked about the rich young ruler. He was not able to surrender to Jesus and he went away sad. He was not willing for a radical transformation. Are we scared at the presence of Jesus because of the impact that it could have on our lives? Do we want to hold things near and dear to us and not surrender them and give them away because we're afraid of what Jesus might ask? See, David had the total opposite reaction to the presence of God. David said in Psalm 84, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. He said, I want to be close to God. I want to be near to him. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than than live in the good life in the homes of the wicked. See, what is our response to God's presence? Do we say, yes, God, I want to draw near to you? Or do we say, no, I want to stay away? In, In Psalm 16, it says, in the Lord's presence, there is fullness of joy. See, the people saw how Jesus transformed that man to heal him, to save him, to restore him. I wonder if they feared something similar would happen to their lives. Sometimes we can be quite content with our lives and even with our sin. We don't want to change. We don't want to surrender. We don't want to yield to the Spirit of God. So we say, Jesus, go away. Jesus, don't stay here. Jesus, you're not welcome here. Because I know that if you hang around any longer, it's going to be some radical change in my life. And I don't think I'm ready for that yet. I don't think I want that yet. What will we tell the Lord today? Stay and change me or leave me the way that I am? See, leave me is the easy answer. It's the comfortable answer. It's what the people told Jesus. Stay and change me is the difficult response. It's the painful response. It's the hard response. But it's also the blessed response. It's also the fruitful response. It's also the one that brings everlasting joy and peace and unity and love. In Matthew 16, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own life, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. See, these are pretty hard words, but Jesus is saying this. You want to be my follower. If you want my presence with you, if you want to be with me, if you want to follow after me, it's going to take a commitment here. It's going to take some transformation. It's going to take some surrender. It's going to take some sacrifice. 
See, the difference between the man and the people was that the man encountered Jesus personally, but the people encountered Jesus at a distance. See, the man encountered Jesus personally. He had an encounter with Jesus that was close and intimate. But the people encountered Jesus just at a distance, and they just saw all these pigs leaving. Sometimes at a distance or from the outside, people can look and say, Oh, Christianity, that's so hard. Too many rules, too much hypocrisy. Those people are foolish. They don't know what they're believing. But it's because it's at a distance and not with an encounter that's intimate and close with Jesus. I believe if we have that intimate encounter with Jesus, then we will be like that man that says, Jesus, I want to follow you. Now, let's look at the response of the man, which was very different from the people. The man was changed, he was healed, he was restored. And his response was a heart to follow Jesus. Mark chapter 5 and verse 18 and 19 says, As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with, with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. See, this man's life was completely destroyed, hopeless, full of pain and misery. Then Jesus comes along and changes the whole narrative, changes the whole story. So his heart is to follow Jesus wherever he went. He didn't know who Jesus was before this. He didn't know what what Jesus was going to do. He didn't know what what he was getting himself into. But all he knew was that Jesus changed him and he wanted to be there with him. He didn't know what was going to happen in the future. He didn't care about the cost. He just wanted to be with Jesus. Luke 9, 23 and 24 says, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. See, that's what this this man wanted to do. He wanted to be a follower. And the question is, how about us? If we've been touched and transformed by Jesus, can we surrender and follow him? We, We might not have had such a radical transformation as this man in one day. But I think many of us can say we have been touched by Jesus. And if you haven't, I want to tell you today that Jesus is here to encounter you. Jesus wants to have an encounter with you. See, without an encounter, it's hard to follow. We have an experience. We've experienced his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his restoration. And our only response should be, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you go. So many others responded to Jesus in a similar way and said, Jesus, I want to follow you. But there were others like the rich young ruler we studied last week that says, no, the cost is too much. It's too difficult. What's our response to Jesus? For all of God's goodness to us, for all that he's done to save us, for all that he's done to forgive us and to transform us and to change us and to bless us and to touch our lives, what do we say to Jesus? But it's interesting, for this man, Jesus told him, no, don't follow me, right? Right? Instead, he said, go home and tell your family what great things God has done for you. See, the other aspect of the man's response was that he had a desire to obey Jesus. Although he wanted to be with Jesus, and who wouldn't want to be with Jesus? Instead, he was willing to obey Jesus. And this should be our response too. See, it says here in verse 20, that the man started to visit the 10 towns. That area was called Decapolis. It was 10 cities in that area. Right? And he began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. In essence, he was really the first apostle to the Gentiles. In essence, he took that good news of what Jesus did, and he was sharing that all over the place. What a wonderful transformation. Our encounter with Jesus should also produce the same response, the desire to obey the Lord and the desire to share God's goodness with others as well. We can learn from this man about sharing the gospel, sharing the good news. Notice what Jesus says here. Jesus tells him not to go to the ten cities. What does Jesus say? Go home and tell your family what the Lord did. But this man's response was to go and start preaching the gospel to all these ten cities. His response was tenfold of what Jesus was asking him. 
Jesus said, just go and tell your family. He went and told 10 other cities. This was just an overflow of his gratitude, of his love, of his, his appreciation for what Jesus had done for him. If we realize the great things that Jesus has done and the great things that Jesus can do for us, I wonder what our response will be. See, the crowds of people, they probably started circulating a negative report. They probably went around to those 10 cities and the news was spreading. Stay away from this guy, Jesus. He's going to cause you financial ruin. Stay away from this guy, Jesus. He's going to cause you a lot of problems. But this man who was healed and restored, he went around preaching. And he went around telling all the good things that Jesus had done for him. Now, there's an interesting story here because two chapters later in, Ma in Mark chapter 7, look at what it says here, Mark 7 verse 31. It says, Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the ten towns. Now, the people told Jesus, get away. So Jesus went and he traveled a few different places. But just two chapters later, we see Jesus coming back to the same region. And when he comes back to the same region, just the next verse it says, a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people, what? Begged him, Jesus, please leave, get out of here, we don't want you here anymore. No. Jesus returned to that same place. And now the people are there, and they're saying, Jesus, please, can you heal this man? See, I think that man who was demon-possessed and became, we can say, the first apostle to the Gentiles, he was really effective. He started spreading the good news. This miracle-working God, we sang it today, right? Miracle worker, light in the darkness. This man, he's around here, he's working. And finally, when he came back, they saw him and they say, that's the guy, that's him, that's Jesus. And maybe the news was spreading. We don't know if this happened in the exact same place. We don't know if it was a different place. It was a, this region called the Capitalist was a pretty large region, 10 different towns uh, in that region. But Jesus came there, and now the response of the people is totally different. And they're begging Jesus, please, can you heal him? And Jesus did. And the question is, what about you today? If Jesus could do it for a man filled with demons, if he could do it for a deaf man, if he could do it for a woman with an issue of blood, if he could do it for Jairus' daughter who was dead, can he do it for you? Do you believe? Can you believe with me today that our way maker, our light in the darkness, our powerful healer, our great deliverer is here today to have an encounter with us? See, we're, we're doing this series of encounters with Jesus. We don't want it just to be something that's intellectual and says, hey, look, this is what Jesus can do. No, we want this to be experiential. To say, I have met with God. I have met with the living God. I have met with Jesus, and he's transformed me, and he's changed me, and he's touched me, and he's helped me, and he's healed me, and he's delivered me. If Jesus could feed, feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, can he do it for you? If Jesus could command the winds and the waves to stand still, could he do something for you? If Jesus can raise, raise Lazarus from the dead, can he do something for you? If Jesus could give sight to a blind man, can he do something for you? Can you believe with me today? If Jesus could heal a soldier's servant, can he do something for you? I don't know what your need is today. I don't know what you're crying out to God for today. But let me tell you, an encounter with Jesus can radically transform our lives. If Jesus can turn the water into the wine, can he do something for you? If Jesus can heal a leper, can he do something for you? If Jesus can make the lame man to walk, can he do something for you? If Jesus can make the infirmed woman who was crouched over stand up straight, can he do something for you? If Jesus can take a man's withered hand and heal him, can he do something for you? Can we believe today in our miracle working God? Can we believe and have faith today? If Jesus can cast out seven devils out of Mary Magdalene, can he do something for you? If Jesus can make the deaf to hear, can he do something for you? If Jesus can raise a young man from the dead to restore him to his mother, can he do something for you? 
If Jesus can walk on water, can he do something impossible for you? If Jesus can predict his death, and then three days again, three days later, rise again from the dead, do you believe in the power of resurrection? What's too hard for Jesus to do today in your life? Do you have a list? This is too hard, this is too hard, this is too hard. Oh, that's the best list to have because this is too hard, this is too hard, this is too hard. Jesus is like, yeah, that's no problem, yeah, that's no problem, yeah, that's no problem. Jesus healed that deaf man in that region. Look at what it says in verse 37. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Everything he does is wonderful. What a turnaround for the testimony of Jesus. When first the people were saying, get away from us, Jesus. We don't want to have anything to do with you. Now a couple chapters later and they're begging and saying, please, Jesus, can you do this for us? Oh, because he's a miracle-working God. Oh, because he's all-powerful. Oh, because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the light in the darkness. He is the one. All power is given to him. What can Jesus do for you today? Let's encounter Jesus. This series is all about encountering Jesus. He wants to meet with us. He wants to do great things for us. He wants to transform us. Worship team, please come. I'm just going to close with this question and a story. Here's my challenge for me and for all of us. Do you want Jesus? Do you want to go with Jesus? Or do you want Jesus to go? Pastor Jim Simbala was is the pastor of uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. And after one service, Pastor Simbala was he was so tired, but he he noticed a man in the in the fifth row who was so, so disheveled. He was filthy looking and he was a mess. But he eyed the pastor and the pastor knew that he wanted to come and talk to him. Now, they had a policy about not giving away money to people uh, off the street. And there was a process that they had to go through. But since he was so tired, Pastor Simbala thought, you know, I'm just going to give him some money and finish off with this because I'm so tired, I I can't deal with this. As the man was approaching, when he was about five feet away, Pastor Simbala started to smell the stench. He said it was a mixture of feces, urine, sweat, the street, and alcohol all together. He started to talk with him and found out that he was sleeping in his own urine just outside of the church. His name was David. He heard, he heard the music inside the church and came in. He had slept the night before in a deserted truck and, and didn't stay in a shelter because he said he almost got killed in the last shelter he stayed at. So Pastor Simbala thought, I'm just going to give him five bucks and get this over with, and he pulled out some money and offered it to the man. And the response of the man, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus that you're talking about. At that moment, he realized it wasn't David that needed prayer, but it was himself, the pastor. He lifted his hands and he said, Lord, forgive me for what I've become. You sent someone searching for you, and I want to give him a few dollars and get rid of him. Please help me. At that moment, Pastor Simbala was just overcome with the love of God, and he started to cry. And David started to cry, and he came closer. And they both embraced a preacher in need of God and a guy off of the street in need of God. And at that moment, the Lord spoke to Pastor Simbala, and this is what the Lord told him. He said, you see that smell. If you don't love that smell, I can never use you because the whole world smells like that to me. All the stinky, smelly sin of humanity. I sent my son to die for that smell. So you are either going to embrace it and love my people in my name, or I can't use you and I'll put you on the shelf. He said, suddenly, that foul, stinky smell turned into a beautiful, fragrant perfume that you could not imagine. Pastor Simbala led him to the Lord. They detoxed him for about four or five days. 
He spent Thanksgiving and Christmas at his house. And that year, they hired him on staff at the church. What a transformation story that is. What broke them was an encounter with Jesus. Can we all stand? We're going to sing today. And we're going to sing this song as a prayer to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus today. I don't know about you, but I need to encounter Jesus today. I don't know about you, I need the presence of Jesus today.